do it like that. <laughs> and there's the fuel window and it's boy. That's what it's all out of fuel. These wonderful live line graphics. That yellow line, that's the course boundary. Okay, so that was uh, kind of an overview of, of all the different sports that we do, but since this theme is primarily uh, football, um, here's a more concentrated clip on just the football effects that, that you'll see on most every Sunday in NFL and college football. <laughs> Like that. Third down and seven. Third down and one. With Joe, pick up the first down. So many of the effects that are in these clips um, that I've worked on over the years with you know, a bunch of other smart people here at the factory. So that's um, some of our visual effects. Um, so what is first and 10? I'm, I'm not sure how many football fans we have in here. Um, show of hands, anybody football fans? OK, so you guys, you guys pretty much know first and 10 uh, is the visual effects system that, um, that illustrates you know, where the down and distance and, and yard line markers are, you know, where the players are trying to get to. <laughs> to extend the drive or to get to, to uh, score in the end zone and whatnot. Um, so it's a virtual, uh, uh, a visual effects system that's designed to uh, basically place graphics in scene and in proper perspective. Um, and in the original case, using uh, sensor data from the cameras, uh, we invented the technology in 1998. And it was de uh, debuted on ESPN Sunday Night Football, so back in the day before NBC bought uh, the rights to Sunday Night Football, it used to be on ESPN, and ESPN kind of went to Monday night, and Sunday night was vacant, so ESPN came back, or uh, NBC came in and got that. Um, but we did debut on ESPN Sunday Night Football uh, back in 98, and this system uh, is completely reliant on having uh, hardware sensors mounted to the broadcast camera. So in one of the slides, upcoming slides, I'll show a picture of what that camera looks like with some of the, with some of the gear mounted to it. Uh, so how does this system work? Uh, the sensor-based system starts with uh, building the broadcast camera. Uh, so we, every stadium has some fixed locations where they expect broadcasters to come in and you know, put up however many cameras uh, they need for their show. Um, it can range from three to like 20, depending on the size of the show. Uh, we'll generally instrument about three to five on average. Um, and so first step is, you know, we build up the cameras. You know, it's got a super expensive broadcast lens, probably about that big, super expensive broadcast camera there. And then to all that gear, to the, to the sticks that it gets mounted on, uh, the heads, we also put our, our circuitry, we call it our RCS, and we tap into a lot of the electronics in the camera to tell us where it's looking, what its uh, zoom voltages are, um, so that we can get uh, pan, tilt, and zoom data. We send that down um, via the audio channel all the way through all the, the cabling in the stadium um, back to the computers on our trucks. Uh, and there we demodulate that to get it into serial data into our computers. And then uh, from there, we have a camera calibration step. Um, and that pretty much is us running software that's, that's got the video piped in. And we have a, a digital model uh, a real coarse digital model of the football field. So it contains all the yard lines and the end zone markers, sometimes some hash marks. And so the calibration step is just the process of going through and matching features in the model with features in the real video. So, you know, they'll go through um, and match 
uh, hash marks, match yard lines, so, you know, the operator will click in the virtual model and then click on the real video and create correspondences there. Uh, and then they'll also go through you know, zoom ranges and making sure aspect ratios and, and everything all match through the zoom, range, the zoom range that the camera's um, uh, uh, capable of. And you know, so they'll iterate on that for probably about 10 minutes uh, at the beginning, usually the beginning of the set day, and get all that working. And once that's working, um, then whenever you move the camera, zoom the camera, um, our virtual model will match the field perfectly. Perfectly, so to speak. There are things that we, we don't measure um, in terms of uh, bounce. You know, a lot of these stadiums, particularly college stadiums, that aren't, uh, they don't really have very secure camera platforms. When, you know, when the game is exciting and the fans are, are happy and they're up cheering and jumping, our camera is doing this, this bouncing motion and we don't have any electronics to capture what that motion is. And so, um, you know, the cameras themselves have some stabilization uh, built in, but oftentimes that gets in the way. Uh, so other than that little bounce, which we correct uh, in, in other ways, which Radford will talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the, the virtual field and the real field and, and the real video match uh, pretty well. Um, so that goes, you know, that's the, the calibration process. Once we get the camera model built from that calibration, then we send that data uh, real time uh, to our rendering computers, and then the rendering computers know how to place the graphics. Um, with the effects that you saw in those videos, it's not just good enough just to composite the graphic over the top of the video because then you'll have graphics, you know, painting over players. So we have an additional uh, chroma keying step, which is essentially everybody here is old enough to have watched TV and watched the weather, um, so they know green screen. Uh, it's the same, same deal except, you know, if you look at the, the, the field, there's a lot more colors uh, on a field than just greens. There's lots of shades of greens, there's dirt, there's painted stuff, there's flesh tones. So we essentially have a multicolor chroma key step, which uh, allows us to um, preserve the players and not have graphics painting on those on the players and still putting it on the field so it looks like it's it's really there. Uh, so that's you know that's the basic flow from you know the camera setup process, building a camera takes about 15 minutes, calibrating another 10. Uh, you do that during set day and it's pretty much good the whole weekend. Um, so you don't have to, you know, sometimes you might have to do small recalibrations if something moves on the platform, but for all intents and purposes, it's good to go and then we can operate the game doing our enhancements uh, without having to worry too much about uh, you know, the camera uh, registration. Um, so you can see in the picture in the upper left there, there's what you know, broadcast camera looks like. Um, I have my, my first Fourier into modeling and that was also the last Fourier, so I'm back in engineering. Um, so again, once it's calibrated, everything just works. Uh, the good thing about that is that it doesn't, since it doesn't rely on features in the video, it still works when um, none of the features, none of the art lines are, are visible. So if you've watched any snow games uh, where the field is completely covered, uh, we still have the, ye the yellow line in the right place because we're relying on our calibrations and math and the camera doesn't care about the scene. The sensors are just uh, wired to the relative pose of the camera and the, and, and, the, and the zoom voltages of the camera. So you can even you know, put a bag over the lens and it still will put things in the proper perspective. Um, uh, so again, the there's another thing. Oh, so the the camera calibration itself is not affected by motion blur. So, oftentimes, well, all the time, uh, at the snap of a ball, especially on a pass play, uh, the cameraman will whip that guy around really, really fast. And so you'll see natural motion blur in the, in the graphics, which is you know by design. But the the camera data, all the uh, the camera parameters aren't affected by that. So we kind of we kind of are insulated from, you know, those those types of things for free with sensors whereas in the computer vision world motion blur is like the devil and you know you never want to have to deal with that but it's part of reality. Um, so what are the cons? Uh, this requires uh, you know fixed camera positions. Um, and as you can see in the in the picture it's not it's near the bottom of the the bottom of the mount kind of towards the front. There's like this little tan box. That's where our, all of our circuitry is. Um, so it's pretty heavy, and so it requires like a really a sturdy uh, uh, mount, which the fixed cameras, you know, they have very sturdy uh, sticks that they get mounted to. But if we wanted to put this on something less sturdy or something mobile, 
then it's not, it's not practical at all. Um, the cameras themselves, like I mentioned, they do have built-in hardware stabilizations for, to address things like that platform bounce, but it, it does bad things with our software primarily because uh, we haven't tapped into how to, how to accurately measure that. So we usually tell the camera guys to turn that off when things go really, really wonky. Um, and it's, it's in, intense in terms of technology. Uh, the box we designed, we wrote all the circuits ourselves, um, and so it's not something that we can get any assistance with, you know, uh, from third parties usually. It's, it's all custom, uh, and so we have to go through careful planning if we want to evolve it. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the hardware that we have here has been around for over a decade, and, you know, uh, parts start to become unavailable, and so it makes it a challenge to try to keep evolving that, that technology. And it's also not cheap, and so when we have hundreds of, hundreds of these things out there, uh, it can be you know, a big challenge trying to uh, up, you know, uh, upgrade the technology you know, and keep up with, with costs. So we try to keep these things in as good working order as we can, but you know, we ship them out all the time, they get beat up, and so there's, there's maintenance in, uh, involved that is kind of expensive. Um, and then also, the, we have to be on site with the TV productions for this. So um, if you have a broadcast that's doing a multi-feed, you know, maybe they're shooting the Super Bowl here and they're broadcasting it you know, internationally, um, you know, we still have to be on site and, we may, we, and we're only going to be enhancing it with one look. Uh, you know, because the way, the way it's currently set up uh, with, the, with the hardware, it, we have to go through extra steps to try to make it... Um, to add variation in the different looks that we're going to be broadcasting. Um, so, you know, there are some cons there. So, movable cameras. You know, what, you have, what you see pictured there is an older picture of uh, a camera that you see all the time in games, Skycams, one of, the, one of the, the companies that make these cameras on this pulley, cable to pulley system. Takes you really close to the action. A lot of times they like to shoot like right behind the huddle. Um, but as you can see, you know, it's got weight, weight limitations for sure, and so our gear is definitely too heavy to be mounted to that and too, and too impractical. Um, and then also you have the, the challenge of how do you get the data back? Um, there's not a lot of cabling coming off of there. Uh, and so uh, mounting our, our existing hardware to something like that becomes completely impractical. Um, and so this is where back in 2004, the year I first started, uh, we started working on a different approach to First and Ten where we do, instead of using sensors, we do everything using computer vision, you know, everything optically. Um, and, you know, for obvious reasons, you, you, you insulate yourself from all the hardware concerns. Uh, it's a lot, uh, the footprint is a lot smaller, it's a lot easier to integrate, but then the problem is exponentially harder because it's strictly computer vision. Um, so yeah, so again, we, we pioneered that in 2004 for replays only, because uh, back then, uh, compute Compute power was very scarce, um, and the problem is was just as hard back then as it is now. Uh, and but you know we, we we were able to to debut that again on ESPN Sunday Night Football, um, and they you know it's it was used for quite a quite a while. So the that legacy optical system again um, had no reliance on the instrumentation. Um, all the image processing was done on the CPU because. There really weren't, there was graphics, acceler hardware accelerated graphics cards for gaming back then, but nothing for like general purpose uh, computing. Um, so it was, uh, all the pro image process was done on the CPU. Um, again, designed for replays because of the, the compute and workflow constraints, we weren't, weren't able to do that uh, live. So how did this system work? Uh, the basic workflow again was, you know, you have an operator sitting in front of the computer and he's watching the play. He's watching, usually he's watching, um, we had a, a fixed length uh, buffer for a clip length, you know, so probably about 15 to 20 seconds. That was probably about the, uh, the, the length of a typical play. Um, so we have that in-memory buffer that we're sitting on. So we're watching the action. Uh, the quarterback, you know, breaks the huddle. He's approaching the line of scrimmage. And right when they're about to get set, our operator will hit record. And so it freezes, freezes everything on that frame and it's queuing up all the, all the buffers in real time uh, uh, for us to come back to for tracking. And so during that freeze frame, the operator is dragging our, our virtual model into place 
so it matches all the right fiducials and features uh, that correspond to the, the models, you know, matching the right hash marks with the, the real hash mark, yard lines with the real yard lines, getting that virtual model set. And once that model is set, uh, then you basically hit the tracking button. So now we've, we've basically stopped time. We, we're frozen, but we want to we want to be ready for the first replay, which means maybe within a five seconds, five to 10 seconds after the, the, the play is done, we need to have this finished clip back to uh, ESPN so that it can go put it in the replay. Which means, so we already stopped time, and now we're already behind time, so in order to catch up, we gotta go faster than real time. Uh, so this system, uh, we tracked every other frame so that we get 2x speed, so once we hit track, it just, you know, fast forwards, it just blazes through, um, catches up, and sometimes along the way, uh, the op if, if the tracking goes a little wonky and things start to shift, uh, the operator has to stop. And again, he's still, he's still got that hard deadline he's thinking in the back of his head, but he's got to stop, drag, you know, things that in the model that have drifted off back into position, and then basically making a manual correction, and then continue. Uh, so it does that, it sends those camera as it's tracking, it sends those camera data, the camera parameters uh, to the rendering machine, and the rendering machine is storing them up. And so once uh, the, the play is over, uh, then the production staff calls for it. Um, the production's replay guys will refeed the clip back to our, through our render, render system, and that system has all the camera parameters for that play in memory, so it knows where to put things. Everything is matched, the, the camera data is matched via time code with specific frames of the video. So it puts everything in the right spot and the right timing. And so that's you know, how the replay system works. Uh, so again, this was, this was an old system. It was built in 2004. So back then, uh, compute power was very limited, even on the CPU. Uh, again, computer vision problems in this domain haven't gotten any harder. Uh, and we had less to work with, so that was always that was a big a big limiting factor, um, and that limited the amount of of, of uh, pixels we could search, amount of features we could we could process, um, and that contributed to the quality of the result. So we had to make a lot of trade offs to get something that was that was good enough. Um, and again, you know, it, we did a lot of interpolation by uh, analyzing every other frame because we had that hard speed requirement where we had, it had to operate at at least 2x real time. Uh, and, and again, the other limitation was, you know, for the most part it would track through most of the plays, but usually as the camera would get closer to the action, let's say the, the running back's going or the receiver's caught the ball and now he's getting tackled, now the, the camera is shooting tighter, we lose features to track, so then the, the model starts to drift but the, the production wants that yellow line in there all the way through the, the entire shot. So our, our operator would have to just kind of manually go in and finagle things and then uh, set a hard out when uh, we hit the point of no return. This is as good as it's going to get. And that's, that's the duration that we'd have the visual effects for. Um, so in light of that, you know, fast forward to present day. Uh, we've got more compute power. We've got same problems, but we want, you know, the, the production is asking for us to not only do this in replay, but can we do this live? Uh, so we've come up with a new system, which Radford is going to talk about in just a second, that solved a lot of the problems in the, um, the old legacy optical system. Now, uh, we, still, we still have the, the hardware-based system in heavy use even today, but what we want to have is a hybrid that takes advantage of both. You know, there's some, there's some clients that don't have as much money, uh, or the install is too incumbent for, uh, too cumbersome for, for them to uh, hire us to install a sensor-based system. So we'd like to have multiple options uh, to, you know, for, for the different client needs. But also, you know, uh, marrying the two uh, technologies together, you gain the benefits of both, and you try to erase the, uh, the drawbacks of each as well. Uh, so that's, you know, keep in mind, so we still have that system here, but now we have this, the, new uh, the new optical system that erases mo many of the problems of the old system uh, with increased computing power. Uh, you know, you'll see that it, it gives us a, the ability to track better um, through harder camera angles and able to track through multiple plays. Um, and because of the 
in the improved tracking, it negates much of the need uh, to manually correct anything. Uh, yeah. in, in the Chrome vision here, uh, you're doing multiple colors. How do you look at when there's, you're doing a three, several hour game. The sun changes, the shadows change, uh, everything you're matching. You... Yep. So, so uh, the question is, game conditions change throughout the game for, for in, in terms of chroma keying. Uh, you've got shadows, you've got sun, you've got planes flying over, casting other shadows, the field gets chewed up. How do we make sure that the quality of the chroma key is intact through the course of the game, the duration of the game? Uh, the only way we can do that is to assign a dedicated operator to sit on our chroma keying app and keep reselecting the colors, keep, keep the palette current with the game conditions. And for the most part, uh, for night games, the conditions really don't change that much. So you, you set, you build your chroma key uh, in, in the beginning of the game, and it pretty much just sits the whole game. Uh, the worst is like Sunday afternoon in uh, uh, the, the Oakland Raiders Stadium during baseball season when you have the baseball diamond, and you get the field chewed up, and you got sun, and you have shadows, and Green Bay is in town, so you've got green uniforms and green, <laughs> green grass, and then the field is chewed up, so like all the you know the, the the darker colored players' flesh tones match the dirt, and so that one that one the operator is sweating and trying to chase, and and that's all you can really do. It's just, you know, but but it ends up doing a pretty good job. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, computer vision filters in there and, and some some intelligence to try to help out the operator, but you know. To your intuition, it's it, there's no there's no easy shortcut to that. You just kind of ride it. Since it's real time, um, what's the delay between the actual filming and what we see on television? So uh, that's a bigger question. So you know, the, the the short answer to that is, for our part of the TV pipeline, we try to keep uh, captured and, and finished output to around no more than like five to six frames at the most, but we're just, we are fairly close, you know, fairly upstream in the, in the whole TV production pipeline. So after we do our enhancements, there's more delay added as, you know, the broadcast sends the video through other gear to put, you know, the lower thirds on, the score bugs, all those other things. So by the end of the pipeline, the delay can be, I don't know, maybe second or two by the time and then it has to hit the satellite to get to your home so by the time it goes through all that it could be on the order of seconds often um, but on the compound usually it's on the order of frames uh, before it hits the satellite yeah. did you do the america's cup race and if so yep. was there anything particularly different about that uh yes we, we did do the america's cup the the main difference is just the camera uh, we had to we had to, uh, to model, there was a, I don't know what brand of camera, but there was a special camera mounted to the helicopters. So we had to uh, basically model that in software, model the behaviors of that camera. Um, I'm not sure if they, what they did to get data to our systems, if it was wireless or, or whatnot. I'm not, that part I'm not sure about, but we did, that was really the only difference we had to do. We had to model um, a new camera. Uh, and then for the specific effects, we may have had to do some, um, I didn't actually work on that, but just kind of from what I heard around the office from the other engineers, we may have had to do some uh, computer vision based tracking to help have the graphics stay with specific sailboats. But for the most part, the same workflow that I described also applied to the America's Cup stuff. Okay, all right, wrap up. All right, now we're gonna talk about a system that I like to call Camera Tracker. Uh, Lewis uh, started mentioning uh, the, des the design of Camera Tracker. Um, the way I imagine it is Camera Tracker is designed to be a general purpose camera tracking software. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of assumptions about the type of camera, the kind of hardware requirements of the computer that the camera is connected to, or the type of sensors that may be connected to the camera. Uh, so we want to use computer vision only, uh, but in the presence of sensors, uh, optionally leverage those as well. Uh, so here what I'm showing you uh, is Camera Tracker in action. This is actually what our operators see in the compound. Um, I joke, but our, our operators are probably the best video game players in the world because there's a lot of uh, effort going into understanding what's going on, a lot of hot keys, a lot of things that they're pressing to kind of nudge things around to make sure that 
uh, what you see here, our virtual field, lines up with the actual image itself. Uh, so at Sport Vision, we call these blue fields. Uh, you'll see it rendered uh, in perspective. Uh, the dots that you'll see all around the screen are measurements that we're making. So most of the measurements, measurements are made at uh, known locations on the football field. Football's a great sport to start out on because we have this uh, very regular known coordinate system. Uh, tons of features that are always in view of the camera. So you'll see on hash marks and on yard lines, on sidelines, uh, we're deriving several measurements. Uh, and all of these measurements uh, combined allow us to solve for these individual camera parameters. And you see that our blue field remains in perspective and looks like it almost belongs to the field. Uh, and that allows us downstream uh, to render the first downline or any other kind of 3D model. Uh, and it just kind of sits on the field. It's in perspective. Um, and some people get tricked into even thinking that the first downline is painted there. Uh, and that's a great success on our part. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, in this case, uh, are those lines that you see in the final broadcast version, or are those reference lines that you... Uh... So these are reference lines. This is our virtual model. So this is only what our operator sees, just to make sure that the operator knows that the tracking is going well. Uh, if he sees the, the model start to slip off, not move in perspective with the image, it's his job to remove the lines. Uh, so that's, that's a skill in and of itself, understanding when that's going to happen. And as Lewis mentioned earlier, that's typically in cases of significant motion blur or extreme camera motion. Uh, and that usually happens on uh, a big pan, a quarterback scramble, or a long pass. So the operators have to be ready to take it off air if they think that the computer vision might potentially fail. Yes, what are the yellow and green dots? Uh, so these are, um, these are our uh, ideas of interesting features. So in addition to the known features uh, of, the for, of the football coordinate system, you know, the hash marks and the yard lines, uh, we also want to find features that we think are significant that are easily trackable. So good features to track. Uh, so what you see in the orange and green are actually locations that we've pinpointed as these are, these are highly trackable and our computer vision will do well specifically on these points. Yes? Um, there seems to be a certain amount of lens curvature effects here. Are you taking... Yeah, absolutely. Because I noticed that the edges you weren't really matching all that well. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, good observation. So yeah, you'll notice on the edges of the frame um, there could potentially be issues for, for multiple reasons. One of them is not measuring the distortion of the lens appropriately, um, and quite often uh, not measuring the actual uh, 3D landscape of the field. So as a part of our rendering system and our legacy first and 10 system, we actually have 3D digital representations of these fields, and we take a, uh, a laser scanner out there to actually uh, decide uh, the height of uh, the field in several different locations across the field. Uh, so if our crown estimate of the field uh, is significantly off, you might also see the lines come off. Um, but then when it comes to distortion, uh, we actually create distortion maps uh, that are actually based on our estimation of the focal length. So if we've incorrectly created the distortion map for this specific lens, uh, then you might see uh, towards the edges of the frame uh, not a perfect match with our, our virtual field. How much does a field vary? But, uh, uh, one example, I wasn't actually there, but they said that, I guess in the Years ago in, in uh, Green Bay, they used to be able to stand on one sideline and they couldn't see the yard lines on the, or the, or the, the, the painted white line on the far sideline because the crown was so, was so uh, prominent. And so, uh, again, that was probably the most extreme case, but you know, the fields are not flat and our field models um, are essentially surface models. Um, right here, it's only represented with a few lines, but you know we basically have a whole bed of nails, and we 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 capture the we survey the height throughout you know regular intervals of the whole field to capture the crown. <coughs> yes. So how do you know where the first down is or the the uh, scrimmage? That's a good question. So our typical first and ten operation system, uh, Lewis described the guy that is manually chroma keying on the fly. We also have another operator there whose job it is to manually specify where the ball has been placed by the referee. There's no automatic system uh, that allows us to know exactly where the ball has been placed. So Does he specify it by the yard marker or by pointing <coughs> on the screen? He literally points to the screen. So, so we, we perform the math to say, uh, this 2D point represents this 3D location, and from that we can derive the, the, yard, the yard line that they specifically need to get to. Yes, sir. On the demo at the beginning of this presentation, I was noticing that 
uh, while the position in the middle where the actual ball is placed is, is right on. Uh, uh, if you look at the edge at the chains and the, the, the point where the chain is stabbed into the earth, it doesn't match. <laughs> so that is sometimes a difficult uh, premise for us. Um, oftentimes the yard line uh, or the first down line can fall on a, a real yard line. Um, so that's always a conversation with the broadcaster uh, and the director to tell us what he would like us to do. Does he want us to render a yellow line that is just sitting on top of a white line? Or do we potentially want to make it wider or nudge it one way or the other so that it doesn't necessarily line up specifically with where you see the orange uh, flag itself? Uh, so that could be a, a conscious decision uh, to move it to the side. Um, but I think quite often, uh, when I watch it on Sundays, uh, if they leave it in when they go to make a measurement, that measurement comes down right on our yard line, uh, and that's a big success for us. At the first and ten, do you put the, the line where the football is and you compute where the ten is, or does the operator have to specify both? It's the, the former. So we just click on the ball, and well, mostly the former. Click on the ball, there's another hotkey in here that doesn't have to think about, it just adds 10 yards to it every time they get a first down. Um, so, again, because we have the camera parameters and because we've already like, surveyed the field and we've calibrated everything, mm -hmm. we can pretty much point and click and determine what the 3D world, real world position of everything is. And anything that we want to extrapolate from that, like the position of the first down, is usually a hot key or so away or automatic. And then you have to remember that across the commercial where the, the 10 is. Yeah, and, and it doesn't change. It doesn't change yeah, it doesn't unless change. we right. click a new spot. Yeah, but the camera's moved. The, the, the camera's, uh, well, the actual physical position of the camera, hopefully, unless the fans vandalize it, didn't move. Yeah. Um, and as long as that doesn't move, we're still good. Because again, it doesn't matter where the camera's looking, we're, we're capturing all of that. So. Yes. Okay, so change the quarter when everything uh, puts uh, 180 degrees, what do you do? We have a nice convenient button on our app that will uh, yeah. do the 180 degree flip for you. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, uh, as we come into uh, the Super Bowl, um, a lot of the cameras are going to be true 4K. And in another presentation, I saw you say that you, uh, for your uh, uh, alpha channel, for for keying, you actually compute pixel by pixel. Uh, is this now a, a race to get uh, faster and faster computers with more processors in a graphics card of, for the application so that you can keep up with uh, true 4K uh, digital? Yeah, that, that's a great observation. And absolutely, we, we would like to be on a per pixel basis because it makes us look as good as possible. We don't want to do any kind of subsampling. Um, but I think Lewis can speak to some 4K experiments he's been so, doing. This, this past summer, ES, um, Monday Night Football asked us to um, ask us if we could support first and 10 on 4K. So then I was charged with making that happen. Um, and for the most part, it, was, it didn't require a lot of changes to the system. But you're right, there's more pixels, more times as many. Um, and so surprisingly, the bottleneck really wasn't the GPUs. Most of, for most of these types of effects, um, the GPU is working on doing uh, fragment-based stuff, shader-based stuff, but it's got a lot of headroom. I mean, it, you see modern-day video games, it's doing way more advanced stuff than this. The biggest bottleneck is bus, uh, bus contention and bus, bus traffic. Uh, moving that many pixels around is really expensive, and then try, you know, we have hard time constraints and now we've got more to do in less time, and the, trans the transfer of these things has been the biggest nightmare. Um, so we, we, we do have a system that they can do 4K. Uh, so we had it working 4K 60 hertz. We were high-fiving, and then ESPN came back and said, uh, we need this to work in 120 hertz. And then we just gave up. <laughs> so yeah, so we need, we always need more speed. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the fragment processing, uh, so far, it goes up with more pixels for sure, but it hasn't been the big bottleneck. You know, bus traffic and, and bus transfer uh, times that has been the biggest bottleneck. Any other questions for you on? 
All right, so uh, we kind of put the cart before the ho horse here. This is uh, the result of Camera Tracker uh, in a long time spent working on the computer vision side of it. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the challenges uh, specifically for uh, computer vision based camera tracking. Uh, so for this application here, as Lewis mentioned, we're at full HD. Uh, depending on the broadcaster, that could be 720, that could be 1080. Uh, and we're always at 60 hertz. Um, so this application actually runs at full frame rate. Um, so I've, I've been fortunate enough to join Sport Vision. Uh, there's this kind of confluence of increased uh, speed of the technology, uh, robustness of computer vision algorithms um, that allows us to do this kind of full, full speed, full frame rate processing uh, using only computer vision. Um, so as, uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, uh, we want to try to minimize the latency uh, completely in our pipeline. Uh, so from when the broadcaster gives us a frame, we want to be able to render the frame with the first downline as quickly as possible. Um, traditional uh, implementations in replay uh, don't need uh, to meet that constraint. So they can kind of take as long as they want, um, as long as it's back before the next commercial break. Uh, so here, uh, we don't get that, and we uh, can't look uh, ahead in time at all. So some of the replay implementations actually get to uh, perform their tracking, uh, and then take into account what's happened in the future and try to do some kind of smart filtering or smart interpolation uh, to, to leverage the data in the future. Here, we only have the data behind us. Um, and we want to try to minimize the amount of time we spent processing that data. Uh, the SkyCam or SpiderCam, uh, there's two different companies that uh, offer to different broadcasters, um, but just the overhead aerial camera connected to, uh, connected to cables um, is unconstrained. So the traditional first and 10 system operates on a PTZ camera, pan, tilt, and zoom. Uh, these aerial cameras uh, have full seven degree of freedom motion. They can go anywhere they want, they can look anywhere they want, they can zoom in as much as they want. So we need to be able to solve for all of those variables uh, at real time. Um, another issue uh, with this type of camera is when the players uh, or referees occlude the hash marks or sidelines, uh, computer vision can't ver do very much when someone's in the way. Uh, that is one of the shortcomings of computer vision, unfortunately. Um, so we have to take into account that we want to only uh, look at features that aren't occluded. Uh, so that is also a part of our, our tool set. Uh, something that is, is very challenging for us and that uh, Lewis talked about earlier are the conditions of the environment that we're in. Uh, so specifically, uh, Green Bay is notorious for having uh, really bad lighting during the day. So as the camera moves uh, closer down to the ground um, and it's a very bright scene, the hash marks and sidelines start to disappear. Uh, so computer vision can't do anything again there because uh, the green grass looks exactly like where the white hash marks are, just because of the lighting conditions. So we also have to deal with things, uh, you know, when it's rainy or snowy. Uh, as Lewis alluded to earlier, um, snowy conditions, computer vision isn't going to be able to do much for you. Uh, so there we've started experimenting with hybrid systems uh, that take advantage of computer vision and also potentially onboard sensors on the camera. Um, and then last but not least, uh, as I mentioned before, the cameramen that control these cameras um, act like they're playing a video game. So they make the camera whip around as fast as possible. They zoom in to the other side of the field, you know, on deep passes you can imagine. Um, the, the scene changes very quickly that you see through the lens. Uh, and so we have to be able to not only solve for those camera parameters, but make sure that, uh, that our constraints on these parameters uh, are accepting of such large variations over time. Um, so here I talked about this confluence of things that uh, have given us the opportunity to uh, create a project like Camera Tracker. We now have faster hardware, faster clock cycles uh, on CPUs. We can now cram a lot of CPUs uh, into a lot of cores into a computer uh, to do some parallel type processing. Uh, so we leverage those things. We also lever uh, leverage uh, open source software when available. Uh, so there's been some uh, great recent advances in nonlinear optimization and in uh, multi-threading. Um, <clears throat> I said earlier, football is a, the easier one to solve for us. It's a very regular coordinate system, and we know where all the features are. Uh, you can imagine other sports, uh, it's, it's not so easy. So football is a good uh, place for us to start, um, but that's not the way uh, we're thinking. We're thinking of, of solving the more general problem. Um, just computer vision to solve any type of camera. Uh, so we want to be able to, if we have information about what we're looking at, like a field, 
uh, leverage that information. Uh, but if we don't have any information about what, what we're looking at, also still be able to do some, some type of camera tracking. Um, as I said, uh, we're using computer vision techniques uh, to do all of this. Um, optionally, if there are sensors on board, some of the companies do have offerings that will tell you what your pan, tilt, roll is, might give you your XYZ, might give you um, encoder counts for your, your, focal, your focus or your zoom. So we want to be able to leverage that data when we can, because like I said, can't, computer vision can't do everything all the time, uh, especially for this application. Uh, and one nice thing, uh, over the years we've built a rapport with the directors and camera operators to try to get them to, to uh, be more amenable to the kind of movement that we prefer for our cameras to exhibit and the type of shots uh, that we prefer, most notably including as many features of the scene as possible. So we prefer shites, or shots that are high and wide, can view as many of the features of the landscape as possible. Uh, some of the camera operators uh, are cowboys and they'll just go off and zoom into a guy's helmet in between plays, uh, and computer vision can't really do much there. Uh, <laughs> where we, uh, we have some work to do uh, in that respect. Uh, so the camera tracker operation itself is quite similar to the legacy system, um, except that it operates live. So the operator does not have the opportunity to go back and adjust uh, the tracking if it happens to fail. Uh, so like I said, we have uh, uh, very good operators, um, and it gets down to ultimately just kind of muscle memory, being able to uh, realize when things might go wrong and being able to adjust them quickly on the fly uh, so that we rarely lose track. Um, so this year, uh, we actually made air um, hundreds of times across CBS, Fox, ESPN, most notably on Monday Night Football. Uh, towards the end of the season, we were on air close to 30, 40 times a game. Um, for those of you not familiar with kind of new technology in the broadcast environment, the directors are completely in control of you know, what makes air. And uh, they're, they're artists themselves, and they don't want you messing with their pixels. So they're re really reluctant to try out new technology. Uh, so it was a great success for us uh, when it comes to ESPN. We were given the creative control to decide when we would go to air. Uh, so instead of the director actually calling for the new technology at a specific point in the game, uh, our operator made the call whether to put the line in or not. And he was completely in control of if he should take it off air. Uh, and if tracking went wrong, it was his fault, or more specifically, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so here are some examples of camera tracker making air this year. You see we're on an aerial camera and the lines will come in a little late here. Um, but you will see them, it's a blue line of scrimmage and a yellow first down line. So we're doing this all in real time. And so from this, this new unique perspective that the directors love, it's just missing the first down line. It doesn't give you the context of how far the player needs to go. So we allow the director to have this kind of technology, and it paints a better story, I think, for the viewer. Here's a particularly rainy game. You can see rain on the lens. You can see a torn up field. Um, the lines aren't immediately recognizable. They kind of blur together with the, the mud and the grass. Here is much cleaner in San Diego. I'll take one of these games any day. So that's an example of camera tracker using computer vision only to do real-time camera tracking, um, but also our, our downstream systems to perform the rendering as well, to perform the chroma keying. So it's kind of all of our systems combined into this one output. Um, so when it comes to future work, uh, like I said, we, we would like to build a more general purpose tool. Uh, so it was designed with that in mind to be used for different sports, to be used in different environments, different locations. So we want to take some time to, to take a step back and uh, figure out what we've learned from football and be able to apply that to our other potential applications uh, that we want to work on. Um, there's also room to, room to improve the computer vision side of things, uh, to, to leverage uh, optional data when it's available. Um, and we, like I said, we want to be able to apply this to, to different domains and to show different uh, types of rendering. So you tell people that you're rendering the first downline, 
Um, it's not all that interesting to them, um, but the same underlying technology could render anything in perspective. So you could have an extra football player out there, a 3D model of a football player running around, and if it looked close enough to the normal football players on the field, maybe nobody would know. Um, you'll also notice uh, coming in, in and out of breaks, several broadcasters uh, use 3D models that maybe look like they're coming out of the ground. They kind of pop out and show maybe stats or player comparisons, uh, things of that nature. Historically, those are done on stationary cameras, uh, but with this work, we can supply, we're just basically a big black box, and we supply the camera parameters for any camera. So if they want to take Skycam and kind of fly around this 3D model that's coming out of the ground, uh, they can do so, and there's no changes to our system at all. They just change what they want to render, how they want to render it. Um, so that's what's next. I want to show you uh, the most recent uh, demo that we came up with. It was last week at the Chiefs versus Patriots game in New England. Um, we've been working on uh, another uh, group of technologies related to player tracking uh, using tags on the players. And so I mentioned to you uh, a few seconds ago about being able to render different things on the screen that are more interesting than just a line sitting on a field. Uh, and this is an example of leveraging our work with camera tracking, with rendering, and with player tracking. Uh, and if you'll excuse me, this was shot on a mobile phone because we didn't have our recording devices set up in New England. It was very, very cold. Uh, this is one of our operator's uh, music choices, uh, so you can complain to him for that. So you see, uh, this is what we call a pointer. Uh, you have the name of the player uh, pointed down to where he is. So the player tracking system uh, knows exactly where that player is uh, in XYZ, and because of the camera tracking system, we know exactly where the camera is. And given all of that data, we can render on screen um, a drop down pointing to any player on the field, uh, or just anything that the player does, whether he runs a route and we want to draw the route under him, or if the ball's in the air, we want to draw the flight path of the ball. All of these technologies are possible because of, of all the things that Lewis and I have been talking about. Um, so what is NextGen Stats? NextGen Stats is this player tracking uh, technology that I referred to. Um, it's a IR-based system that puts actual tags in the player's uniforms. Um, it's supplied by a third-party company, uh, but we work with multiple companies to be able to do this kind of technology and to provide our own rendering products based on uh, this kind of player tracking technology. Uh, there's multiple ways to do it. It doesn't have to necessarily be an IR-based system. You could do some kind of optical, computer vision-based tracking. Um, but what we found in our experiments is that uh, football specifically is very difficult to do given the offensive and defensive lines, how close they are together, and how much they occlude each other. You know, it, it's easier to track maybe a wide receiver or a quarterback um, who isn't as occluded as everyone along those lines. Um, so here's an example of what we do with some of this player tracking information. The kind of oh. Okay, yes. Yes, yeah, so this is explaining these IR tags and how a player tracking system might work uh, leveraging this technology. Two player tracking tags are installed on every player. One in each shoulder pad. The player tracking tags are small, lightweight, and easy to install. The tags stream data 25 times a second and weigh only a half ounce per tag. The player tags have been tested to withstand high force and repeated impact, angular impact, and extreme heat and moisture conditions. By using two tags, the system provides superior player orientation information in 3D space and ensures critical redundancy. The battery life extends between six and eight months, allowing teams to install the tags once at the beginning of the season with little or no <coughs> maintenance afterward. A minimum of 10 data receivers are distributed around the middle or upper bowl of the venue. The receivers use state-of-the-art technology, taking advantage of power over Ethernet rather than local power sources. Cat 5 e cable is run and hidden behind ribbon boards for a near zero aesthetic impact. Additionally, the receivers operate on the 6.5 gigahertz bandwidth, which is critical to ensuring the system doesn't interfere with other wireless systems within the 2.4 or 5.8 gigahertz range. 
Together, the receivers and tags provide tracking accuracy up to plus or minus four inches. The system utilizes a four-rack unit tracking computer that is stored in a room or closet enclosed in a weatherproof housing. The computer stores data such as player participation and who is on the field, the individual player's position, velocity, acceleration, distance traveled in play, and total distance traveled in the game. Sport Vision's player tracking system. So as you can see there, there's a lot of useful information that can be derived from these player tags, and it's not only useful for the application of live broadcast enhancement or replay broadcast enhancement, it's useful to the players and teams themselves uh, to, to figure out uh, how hard players are working, how far they've traveled, how fast they're running, comparing to their, to their global averages, uh, to their maximum speeds. Um, so uh, in addition to just providing broadcast enhancements, so we now have access to all of this data, uh, that we would also like to leverage, that we'd like to build some next-gen tools, uh, next-gen, next-gen, uh, to, to leverage this type of information and, and provide products for, for players and coaches um, for that specific reason. Uh, and here is an example reel of what we can do with this information, specifically for broadcast enhancement. Look at Jimmy Smith against Thomas, gave him a cushion. So all of this data is generated automatically, the separation between the two players. He was just named the backup quarterback this week. That's right, moved up from here you have player personnel listed. Uh, so if you can't see who's on the field, we can automatically tell you just based on their location. Uh, we know they're not on the sideline, so they must be in the huddle. Stats presented by Go90. D'Angelo Hall. This was on the Murray fumble. Hall in the right position. Wow. Traveled 49 yards to get the football and take it to the end zone. Well, let's take a look at Next Gen Stats presented by Go90. It's going to be the reverse to Tavon Austin. You're going to see the acceleration, the change of speeds, popping out at 19 miles per hour. He runs over 50 yards to get into the end zone from 26 yards out. All right, so that's our next uh, gen system. Luce, you want to come back up? Um, well, the player's agent should be able to get this data next negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet that's the NFL owns the rights to the data, and I'm sure that's on their, their radar to be able to sell it to whoever is willing to pay for it. So, uh, so we'll close up with some final thoughts, and then we'll open everything up for questions. Um, yeah, just a few. Um, so, you know, as you can see, like, it, as Bradford described, uh, on the optical tracking uh, uh, front, uh, there's a lot of domain specificity there, and we have to come up with algorithms um, that, so, some that are general that apply to any domain, but in the case of the football system, you know, we have a lot of football specific algorithms that's taking advantage of the fact that you know, we have a painted cheat sheet on the field. Um, that is the exception and not the rule. So if we go to hockey, if we go to you know, Golden Globes, go to a Democratic or Republican National Convention, and we want to do the same thing, we have to come up with different models, we have to come up with different algorithms that are suited to the venue. Um, so that, that makes it a challenge. We try to leverage as much gener you know, generality as possible, but we certainly have to get very specific depending on the domain. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and as, as people you know, can intuit and have mentioned, uh, the algorithms just get more sophisticated and compute power, there's never enough compute power. Um, and then figuring out how to get more visual effects, more computing in the same hard time constraint is a, a big challenge. Because again, uh, the, you know, most of the video runs at 60 hertz or 30 hertz, but a lot of the, high, the higher res uh, formats are 60 hertz formats, so you got more to do with the same amount of time, and you guys gotta turn water into wine. So, um, so that's uh, pretty much it. And you guys have been asking questions, so if there's any more questions, feel free. Uh, and also, we have uh, 
James Painter and Patrick Schoen in the house who are uh, experts uh, in non-football related things at Sport Vision, other advanced technology. So if you have questions about other Sport Vision things that aren't football specific, we'd be happy to take those as well. Yes, sir. Um, I just came back from the Consumer Electronics Show and there was a lot of uh, VR activity in terms of uh, uh, startups demonstrating products <coughs> using fixed cameras in the stadium to create a virtual view so that you could put on your VR goggles and pretend to be at any location in the stadium you want to be, including on the sidelines. Um, are you working in that area? <laughs> we, so, uh, there's nothing that we would care to mention now. Uh, <laughs> There's a, so, so the field that you're mentioning is free viewpoint video. I think it's the holy grail of computer vision. It's being able, being able to show any perspective um, given some knowledge about the scene, uh, but not necessarily be, having the ability to place a camera anywhere that you want. So the application that you mentioned specifically, uh, you can accomplish that by putting some you know, 360 camera rigs out on the field and allowing somebody to sit there. Um, but the cooler thing is being able to allow the user to actually place their camera where they want. And that's fr free viewpoint video. Um, several people uh, are investigating in this space. Several companies have some uh, very impressive demo reels. If you go to the, um, to the website for this talk, uh, we've uh, shown a couple of demonstrations of similar things. Um, not necessarily free viewpoint video, but on the way to free viewpoint video. So this is leveraging several high resolution cameras that are all kind of uh, in a row. And what they can do is kind of do uh, frame interpolation moving between the cameras, almost like the, the Matrix effect, if you're familiar with the 2005 movie. Um, they basically took a big uh, rig of cameras that went 360 degrees, and they translated between all of these camera angles. Uh, so these companies are doing similar things with higher resolutions uh, and can do some really interesting stuff uh, for uh, football, baseball, um, and soccer, I think, actually uh, used in the last World Cup. Basketball as well. Actually, can I add a little to that? Absolutely. Uh, actually, they, they do some volumetric uh, pixel uh, rendering. There's a demo of that too. But the uh, eye view that, that we mentioned, on, or, sorry, eye vision system, that, that is more of the bullet time, <laughs> you know, panning around. But uh, the Intel CEO demonstrated the free view on their new Surface for uh, live live action, so so they do have something <laughs> that they're trying to get out there right now, so. Yeah. yeah. And that was by Replay Technologies uh, Systems. Uh, yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's, uh, there are numerous applications. I think it'd be very cool to be able to put yourselves uh, in the athlete's view uh, and be able to see what they saw, whether it's a quarterback blowing a coverage or whether it's LeBron James missing a pass or getting the ball stolen a couple days ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, that's very cool technology and uh, we are familiar with the space. Actually, one more thing. Uh, Sport Vision did do synthetic video before. <laughs> Patrick Shaw was uh, one of the engineers on that, similar, that, that very product. And which it was kind of a, well, you want to mention a little. Yeah, basically it, it pauses video and changes the camera angle, so we need to create a 3D world today. The challenge is the, the creative background and the stadium model, and then the players, the current player part is a bit automatic, automated, but it needs some kind of work. That was the 2008. So what's the, the most difficult, I mean, I'm thinking NASCAR or golf, what, I mean, golf for tracking the drive, I mean, how is, are you guys, is your system being used for golf, or? So we have a couple of systems in golf. I don't know about drives specifically right now. Yeah, that, that I don't know specifically either. Um, the, the system we have in golf right now is pretty new. Um, it's still in the developmental stage. I mean, we're, it's in use, but it's still rapidly evolving. Um, I think we really kind of launched it with, you know, partnering with the networks this summer, this past summer. Um, so I don't know a lot of the specifics about it. I know it's using computer vision don't know that it's using any sensor-based stuff, I'm not sure. Um, but we've got, you know, each sport will have some overlapping systems, but also some very different systems. So like NASCAR, that's a completely different system, completely different hardware mounted, uh, installed in all the cars, giving us a lot of telemetry data. So, you know, we kind of build hardware as needed, and then 
we leverage systems as much as we can and we write new ones where it as well. Carl actually worked on uh, NASCAR stuff back in the day as well. So that technology has been around uh, for a while. Uh, for golf specifically, we also have the rangefinder application. Uh, so you may see when you're watching uh, the PGA Tour, I think on Fox, uh, it'll tell you the distance to the pin uh, from the current player. And it's almost like a cloud hovering above the pin pointing down to it and gives you the distance. Uh, so that system combines um, IMUs and GPS uh, to be able to perform that type of augmented reality. Currently, there's no computer vision aspect of that system. I think eventually, like we've been mentioning, you combine the two and you get a much better solution. Is there a lot of computer vision overlap with uh, autonomous vehicles? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, the problem that I'm most interested in for my career is just general purpose camera tracking, but the applications I think are quite similar for augmented reality and for our, our autonomous vehicles. Uh, if you can build a multi-camera system that can perform uh, augmented reality, you know, leveraging bundle adjustment, leveraging extra, extra sensors that might be built into the cameras, uh, you start talking about a system that's quite similar to the autonomous vehicles that we see driving around Silicon Valley today. Uh, so I think when you're designing a general purpose system, you should keep in mind that uh, if you want it to be truly general purpose, it should be able to solve the autonomous driving problem, um, but that's not necessarily the application that we are interested in. But yes, very similar technologies. Okay. Yeah, speaking of even other sports and events, will sports mission be used at all in the Summer Olympic Games later this year in Rio? Uh, can you re repeat that? Well, yeah. sports pitch will be part of the Summer Olympic Games in Rio later this year. Oh, um, or how will it be used? So historically, um, the, well, the effect that we use uh, for the Olympics is what they call strong motion, where they basically have a system where they um, kind of makes it look uh, like a stop motion type of effect where you overlap every frame of uh, a diver's descent composite every, every, you know, at regular intervals, composite every uh, position pose of that diver on one frame so that you kind of see, you know, the little stop motion effect of, of the diver or the gymnast or whatnot. Uh, so Olympics wise, that's typically all we do. And um, we haven't done a lot of other things uh, thus far, but um, there's a lot, there's a lot of competition now. When we started, we were the only game in town solving these hard problems. Um, as hardware and, and open source software has become a little bit more commoditized, we've got a lot more competition in this space. So, you know, whoever comes up with the, the, the cooler effects that at the cooler price points, we usually get hired, you know, for the Olympics or some of these other broadcasts. So. And some of the graphics that you'll see on the Olympics um, are we're capable of doing with our systems. We're just not necessarily involved in the Olympics right now. So when you see uh, lane markers, you know, sometimes we'll show the flags or the names of the players. Um, that's all doable with one of our systems, either the, the PTZ system that tells you, uh, given all of the sensors on the camera, or you know, using computer vision, I think, would, would be doable as well. What are we going to see in the Super Bowl? Oh. <laughs> um. Worth watching. Yes, absolutely worth watching. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think any of our technology will be involved with this year's Super Bowl. Um, there will be first and 10 line from a different system. Um, and I think that there will likely be player tracking involved, the kind of next gen stuff, just not, not the kind of things that we've shown you here. Yeah, so we, we, um, uh, we're gonna be on next year's Super Bowl. Um, but for this year, usually the, the networks they keep a lot of stuff a little close to the vest, so if you're working on the show, they'll like usually around this weekend, they'll be internally testing new effects that they want to debut on the Super Bowl, and some make it and some don't. Um, so we're not privy to, to that since we're not going to be working on this particular Super Bowl, but stay tuned. Next year we'll have maybe one of these talks and we'll give you the preview one. I'll tell you, this will be the last Super Bowl that doesn't have a live first and 10 from the Sky Cam. <laughs> <laughs> when there's an instant replay, do the refs see the first and ten marks on the field? I, do you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think they see clean video, but I'm... I, that's as, as far as I'm aware, it's clean video. Just yeah. completely untouched by the broadcaster at all. I guess they don't want to accuse us of cheating for the Niners or the Raiders or anyone, so... <laughs> yeah. Do you 
mentioned you were planning on expanding this technology past for sports. Um, you said mentioned, I think, uh, political meetings, uh, speeches. Um, are there any other certain events you were planning in the future? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, building this kind of technology, when you want to make it general purpose enough that it can, can be used in these kind of environments, um, but I think specifically anywhere that you can create a, a uh, map of the environment quite easily. Um, so things that specifically come off the top of my head, you know, the broadcast environment uh, in studio. So, you know, when you're watching SportsCenter or something, you'll oftentimes see uh, augmented reality. Uh, those are usually from highly instrumented cameras. Uh, so usually when you're watching SportsCenter, you might see an extra screen or maybe a flag off in the distance. That isn't actually there. Um, but they have the advantage of using these very expensive uh, sensors. So we actually did do that, which you just mentioned before your time. Um, uh, so Turner Sports, uh, for their baseball studio show, they I think they had, um, I don't remember which talent, which baseball player they had in the studio, but they wanted uh, the batter to demonstrate virtually, like, you know, how to properly attack a pitch. And so um, they used the, the rendering system that we described here in a studio setting. Uh, they had the, you know, the, the talent up with the bat, and we, and we had a virtual baseball in perspective with a virtual baseball trail. Um, what you did see pictured also up there was our pitch effect system that does baseball tracking. So we used that system, um, the, the same system we used for live broadcast, uh, and we used that in the studio. So we, we, we calibrated the camera, registered everything, so that we could we put the virtual graphics up, and there's probably it's probably in the shot there. Um, I don't know. I guess Raptor's looking for it. Um, but yeah, so we had a virtual uh, pitch trail. You know, suspended in air with a virtual ball, and the batter, uh, you know, the talent describing how to how to hit the pitch. Um, and then also, in, in terms of general use, we did this a similar thing for the Golden Globes uh, a few years ago. Uh, you know, during the red carpet, uh, the network wanted. Uh, us to show uh, a past version, life-size past version, virtual version of uh, the actors and actors or the, the, the actresses in the dresses that they wore the previous year. So they would walk up, you know, and they're doing their interview. They're in their current year's dress, and then we put the virtual animate is like a full movie sequence, but in perspective, you know, kind of projected, looked like a hologram kind of. And you know, we, we animated that up right next to them. And they're like, oh, here's, you know, when the towel throw in last year's stuff. And this is what she's wearing this year and, you know, how, how that goes. So those are, the, those are the two incidences outside of a sports venue um, that come to mind where we actually took the same system um, and had success. And we, we got an Emmy for the Turner Studio thing. Um, so that was, and, and that was really not much extra effort because we designed it to be, you know, pretty general purpose, so. Uh, how about the lesser, Lesser watch sports, uh, I'm thinking fencing, curling, or whatever. You guys get involved in all oh, no, that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, can't, you can't see a sword in fencing. Right. Sure. It just moves. I think fast. we I think we did boxing once. I think. I don't know if we went to air with it or we just was on site for a test. We've done bowling uh, years ago. We haven't done fencing. We've done some tests for tennis, but I think um, the incumbent, I think Hawkeye at the time, um, had that pretty buttoned up, so we weren't able to get in there. Uh, it's not it's widely watched, but we, we did do some stuff with soccer. Um, other sm lesser watched sports, I think those are the ones that, that come to mind. But, uh, but I think part of the issue with doing these, uh, these smaller sports or even lower divisional games, college games, high school games, is the, the cost. Yeah. Uh, so having these really expensive uh, sensors on these cameras makes it really difficult to do this kind of live augmented reality. So now that we have a computer vision based product, it makes things a little cheaper. You don't need the infrastructure, you don't need the calibration time. Um, so hopefully we can start getting into these smaller markets. So how many sports teams are using this for their own analytics? Um, the football stuff, zero because uh, the stuff that we describe is more for um, visual effects. Uh, but baseball, our baseball tracking system where we track every pitch, every play, all that, uh, that data has been made available to not only the public but also the teams. We don't own that data, Major League Baseball owns it. 
Um, but but certain teams do subscribe to that. And I, but we do um, also do tracking in the minors. I'm not sure what the business deal we have worked out with um, ownership of that data for the minor leagues and and, and you know have, uh, getting teams as customers to subscribe to that data. Don't know the business uh, you know legalities of that, but. Uh, you know the the baseball system does have that data out there to the public and subscribers, team subscribers. Um, our NASCAR data uh, is a it's available. The same thing can be done with that, but NASCAR so far has not um, productized the data, uh, and so right now the only um, non-broadcast use of that data is in a you know our race view digital app, which essentially is a complete. You know, virtual, you know, real-time, live, virtual uh, view of the of the actual broadcast race, where you can follow your own drivers, change your viewpoints, and all that. And so, um, so yeah. So baseball is probably the biggest example of what of what you're asking. Well, thank you.